Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Safeguarding the Air Travel Industry, Arc Insights and the Need for Collaboration. Hi, I'm Judy Howard uh, with our Operations and Customer Experience team here at Arc, and I'm happy to have with me Cornelius Hatting, who is going to be our guest presenter for um, this afternoon, for today. Um, and Cornelius has been with Arc for over um, for over three years, and he has over 18 years of experience in the um, area of risk management, and he's been with startups to larger companies all around the globe. So he and his team are always working to help um, with fraud awareness, educational opportunities, and to really combat fraud for our customers. Uh, with him in the room here today, I have also um, Doug Nass, who many of you probably know as well. He's our Director of Fraud Investigations. And, uh, Doug has over 25 years of experience on uh, So he and Cornelius together bring together uh, a lot of knowledge. So we encourage you as we go through the presentation today to ask questions. Uh, we'll do those intermittently throughout the presentation. So how you do those is just go to the right-hand side to the control panel. You type in your questions in that little question box. And we'll try to get to them as many as we can through the presentation. The ones we don't get to, we'll follow up and answer those individually and directly. So without further ado, Cornelius, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, welcome, everyone. This is our second year of fraud awareness, and uh, we're very happy to have extended this uh, to the airlines as well. So, And we seem to have quite a number of participants online. So thank you and welcome for joining us. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that we have a number of uh, additional airline webinars coming up through the month. Uh, one to look out for is the Amex GBT and Delta session, uh, where they will be discussing collaboration. And then we will also have a session on loyalty fraud. I think that's a pain point for a lot of airlines at the moment. And uh, hopefully there'll be some good insights that you could take away there uh, from those couple. Earlier, oh, sorry, late, late August, we had another webinar. Unfortunately, they couldn't attend uh, during the month of September. And that was a webinar between Ethica and South African Airlines. And they were talking about the impact of chargebacks and uh, and collaboration and the need of collaboration there. So keep an eye out for that. We'll be posting those out on our website. Uh, there's recorded sessions, so um, you can still view those once they get posted out. So uh, you, you wouldn't miss anything. Okay, so the goal we set for today is to briefly touch on why we have a revenue integrity team in, excuse me, in place here at ARC. We will also be touching on what we are developing as new and different in relation to risk and irregularity events, and how that couples with our alternative business requirements set in place for all the distribution channels and how these actions could support revenue integrity through positive, effective, and timely action. The next slide will help us level set on what it is we are hoping to achieve. Sorry, I fell a bit behind on my slides, so I hope we all caught up right there. <laughs> So the next slide will help us level set on what we are hoping to achieve. I apologize for how basic it is because it is really just the words we are going after. Yeah. So for me, it's going to be, I'm only going to focus on three words that you can see on the slide. The first is the revenue integrity. It states there, this is to prevent the recurrence of issues leading to revenue leakage or compliance risk. It, it seems very straightforward if you apply this to a single operation, but in our industry, it's a great deal more complex, considering the multiple airline distribution channels, all with different business models and objectives. It is also an ever-changing landscape, making it even more difficult to tackle some of the elements alone. I'm referencing here the dark web and all the good stuff that comes from there <laughs> that we deal with and see every day. So, uh, and then, of course, that re leads us into something we do and reference every day, risk management. When I talk to my peers, they ask me what I do, that's risk management, right? And I think it's pretty much the same for all of us. Is it, does it still stand true today? And I want to validate that, and yes, it does. We all identify, analyze, assess, and hopefully avoid the risk associated with, with what we are looking at. Now, this alone is not meant to get rid of fraud or risk in doing business, but understanding and managing it through collaboration can help reduce its impact. Leading right into my third word, which is collaboration, and the other states it's to, join, to, join, to work jointly with others in an intellectual endeavor. This is something we hope to drive home today and with your support, build on. 
Park has been collecting data during the past couple of years where collaboration with our stakeholders has shown positive results related to revenue integrity. Yes, the airline industry is a competitive environment and it does not always foster collaboration. Okay. Does not always foster collaboration. Fraudsters are not selective on whom they fly. With that in mind, uh, let's look at what ARC is doing today, what we plan on doing moving forward, and fundamentally why ARC does risk management, along with some basic statistics. The next four slides will provide you with an overview of what governs us. But I warn you, this is going to be boring. Doug and I will be doing our best to keep it short and to the point. Should anyone have any questions or feel lost after this or need access to the documents reference, please reach out to us and we can help. So why risk and revenue integrity management at ARC? Well, other than being a strong driver behind our mission statement, we have five core governing documents telling us why, such as the agency reporting agreement. This is the three-party agreement between airlines, agents, and ARC, establishing the expectations of how an agent should conduct business in this environment. This document is governed and maintained by a joint group called the Joint Advisory Board of the Agent Reporting Agreement, made up of airlines, agents, and agents association members. The second is the Industry Agent Handbook. This is the operational guide for agents and is the backbone of the ARA. The third and fourth are Carrier Services Agreement and the Manual for Airlines. This is similar to the ARA and IAH, but for the airlines. A greater number of reasons why we hope to do more with our irregularity and risk events stem from these agreements. The first does not have a direct impact on the airlines, but mainly on the relationship between ARC and the agent. This is the ARC pay, previously known as TAS, Travel Agency Service Fee, where agents are allowed to transact services, service fees via ARC as the, as the acting merchant. Behaviors in the environment are closely monitored and help identify concerns early before there's a potential impact downstream to the airline. Having the why identified, let's have a quick look. This is the boring part, guys, of what each one of these documents refer to. We have scoped, we have scoped it down to a great deal, and but to a great deal, and we will not touch on every section, but rather just have them visible for, for, for your future reference. Note, all these manuals are available on our website, so you feel free to download those for future uh, reading. I also ask that you don't drop off, as we will need you for our, for our, uh, uh, for our next sessions uh, later in the presentation. And Cornelius, this is Chris. Where sometimes we uh, internally joke, if you uh, have trouble sleeping at night, open up any of those documents, and you will soon fall quickly to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> But to us, it's very important. <laughs> no, needless to say, so uh, starting off, we look at the carrier services agreement and the manual and the manual for airlines, and we reference here section 12, uh, where it breaks out ARPS revenue integrity solutions, and and this is the re this is the recovery of funds should an agent default at any point in time uh, during their life cycle with ARC. Now, to date, 98 percent. Plus of agent defaults are due to business failures. Historically, and Doug has some stats on that, it was a totally different environment. As of 2018, ARC had $65,000 in unrecovered debt due to these business failures, uh, leading to default and termination of an agent. That's pretty good, uh, all things considered, of doing, what, $90 billion a year through ARC. So uh, having that as an unrecovered amount is yeah, 65000 is awesome. When I started 24, 25 years ago, uh, so these would be 1994, 1995 dollars, uh, somewhere in 30, 35 million dollars a year was walking out the door. Um, in today's dollars, that would be the equivalent of somewhere about uh, 65 to 70 million dollars. So we've made uh, lots of improvements in that area. It's been a long, tough fight. But uh, we've, I think, uh, done a pretty good job of driving a lot of the serial fraudsters uh, that used to commit bust outs uh, back in the day. Yeah. So uh, further, further to Section 12, uh, we also touch on ARC's fraud prevention programs, 
will be monitored for card not present fraud, refund and exchange schemes, non-reporting of tickets, stolen art traffic documents. Although a data concept, we look at we look at this from an angle of hacking and of bridges being left open between agents and other and other distribution channels, along with a line of other fraudulent activities identified in these governing documents. And we we initially broke out something like 38 events that could be affected here, and we've narrowed it down quite quite a bit. Fraud investigations is another significant part of what ARC does, and this is led by Doug. This includes activities engaging with law enforcement on matters affecting airlines and agents. And Doug, I don't know if you want to throw uh, some Yeah, I, I like to think that we're pretty uh, proactive uh, in that area. Um, it, it's one thing to stop fraudsters from committing a crime, but historically when we would see some of the same or we have an idea that the same fraudsters are in there targeting our industry over and over again, um, we'd like to do what we can to get them identified and uh, get cases referred out to law enforcement and have some positive uh, effects. So over the years, uh, quite a few people have gone to, uh, gone to prison, um, not as many as I'd like, <laughs> but uh, you know, they've paid for their crime, at least uh, in the eyes of justice. Uh, very few monies are ever recovered, but occasionally um, agencies and airlines are, are made whole. But uh, it is something that to this day, we do spend a lot of time going after these serial fraudsters targeting our industry. At least the satisfaction is in having them locked up, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So in addition to all of that, we also perform daily audits utilizing our early warning tool, where we look at, at incoming transactions, and we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later down the, down, the, uh, down the presentation. Section 14 refers to products and services related to revenue recovery, such as our revenue recovery services, RRS, our ARC member manager environment, and our ticket resolution in environment uh, related to ARA-specific memos. So note, there are only a small number of memo reasons on which we could enforce our uh, reporting agreement, the agent reporting agreement. And this is also a need and a re reason why we're looking at the future state of irregularities and risk events. Um, in addition, there's the, the last service that we have there is the memo resolution for non-ARA memos, and that's mainly the recovery, and that's not necessarily a negative action on the agent that can be done there. So it's all a bit complex, and we're trying to work through that complexity with our future state. All these services are available to you. If you need more information on this, let us know, and we can put you in touch with the right people. The Section 13 is, is just an overview. It doesn't really uh, uh, have any impact on the airlines as such, but it's, a, it's good to know that it exists. And, um, and this is the travel agent arbiter section where the travel agent arbiter is empowered to, re to resolve disputes arising from ARC's actions as it relates to the default or termination of, its, of, an, of an ARC agent. And Cronus, I'd yeah. just like to add, a lot of people wonder you know, when things are going wrong within an agency why we just don't automatically terminate. Um, it's also, we take our action with the mind of, we may have to defend our action with the travel agent arbiter, and um, we want to ensure that we're on solid footing when we do take an action. Um, so we would much rather intervene with an, a with an agent, get them corrected, make sure that they're not continuing to do what they're uh, you know, anything that's impacting the carriers negatively, and then move on. Uh, keep them viable, and then keep them in the system. Maybe monitor them, and, and we will touch on that later. Get them to stop the activity and move on. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, no, good information, and I'm just going to interject a question here, um, and that is, has ARC um, prosecuted and recovered any dues from defaulting agents in the recent past? And so I can speak to recovery, um, and that probably can touch on some prosecutions. But uh, we've definitely, on a daily basis, we do recovery efforts uh, related to defaulted agents. Of course, we do that within a certain KPI, and it's normally within 24 hours we do that recovery, and the agent remains with us in good standing. So uh, we try to, to get the agent not into a terminated uh, status. We work with them, and we resolve it. 
if for any other reasons and I'm getting too much into operations, Doug, Doug's going to give me a kick. But um, okay. we could also sign the agent up for a payment plan, et cetera, and, uh, and, 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 and recover funds uh, down, downstream that way as well. So we do do a lot of work around recovery. And we'll touch on that a little bit later as well as to what that looks like in brief. But uh, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, that. and uh, we haven't really prosecuted anyone in a very long time or had anyone prosecuted, um, meaning agency owners, because when the agencies today are going down, it's ten, it tends to be for a business failure. So it could be their model. They got caught up into something that uh, un was unforeseen. They're not able to pay for their tickets. Uh, now, 20 years ago, when the agency owner or fraudster uh, was the one committing the crime, yes, we were pretty proactive. Um, some agency owners did go to uh, get, did go to prison, but typically. Recovering monies from them has not always been easy. The, typically, the funds that were taken are long gone uh, by the time law enforcement gets involved. All right. So next, we will touch on documents that govern com, governance, governs the compliance and the business practices of an agent. This is speaking directly to the uh, agent reporting agreement. Okay. So in order to become an ARC accredited agent, the agent must complete an application form and in the application provide a great deal of information as well as acknowledge the requirements as set out under the ARA, especially subsection 8.3, addressing all requirements to be accepted and to remain an ARC accredited agent. A list of these requirements could be referenced in sections 831 through 8384, and I'm not going to list them out here today because You'll definitely leave us if we if I if I'm to do that. Section 10 states the agency is required to comply with all applicable laws, inclusive of PCI DSS, especially considering the U.S. is a very uh, heavy uh, card not present environment. That is quite uh, important. Section 13 stipulates that ARC has the right to remove an agent for fraudulent conduct such as falsification of sales reports, misuse of the IAR settlement environment, and if there is a clear and present danger of substantial loss to ARC or the airlines. And section 33 refers to conditions under which ARC may deem an agent to be in default or places, uh, places them under additional agent operating requirements, such as dishonored ARC drafts, unreported sales, and improperly reported transactions, failures to submit sales reports, etc. Our next slide uh, is, rep is referencing the IAH, which is the handbook the agent uses to um, operate, and it reflects on the reasons affecting an agent standing with ARC in more detail. So, sec so here we're mainly going to look at section F and K, which list the breaches of an agent. We mentioned some of these already, and we'll touch on them again as we build towards our irregularity and risk event environment. At a glance, these breaches are failure to report all traffic documents, issuing credit card transactions without the authority of the cardholder, failure to account for traffic documents, exchanges or service coupons, falsification of reports, showing signs that could lead to bust outs, reporting duplicate or invalid uh, credit memos, using a credit card in the name of the agent, um, submitting for refund exchanges, exchanges or reiss reissuance, of our traffic documents already used, uh, and then of course the misuse of our settlement environment. Section K provides the criteria on how an agent should submit their sales report. So it's clearly clear, clear guidelines are provided, and there should really be no um, misuse of the system there. And that, and we look out for that. And then there's the ArcPay slash TAP agreement we mentioned earlier. With a great deal of this already in place, what more is there for us to do, you might ask? Well, this is where we are looking to apply our irregularity and risk event criteria, as we've mentioned so many times already, to enable us to act quickly. Um, historically, there was the need to wait for a significant loss, and Doug, Doug identified this a little bit earlier, but we hope to move away from this thinking. Yeah, and uh, I'd just like to add, historically, we've been very reactive in um, uh, when we intervene with agents. We, will, uh, we want to be more proactive moving forward. Um, we want to spot these irregularities or risk events 
when they're small or when they first start because we do find that some agents will will uh, find a loophole in the system or a gap and maybe even accidentally and if they're not if the if it's not identified early they might leave them open to seeing if they can pull it off again and of course these are leading to financial impacts uh, on our airline stakeholders um, so we are we continue to put things in place systems and processes in place to start spotting these earlier uh, but we're still a work in progress and uh, some of our documentation is still needs to adapt to this more proactive environment. We're working on that. So it's, um, uh, you know, this is a future state. Uh, we have a foot in the past. We have a foot in the future and we're making progress. Okay, and I'm just going to interject a couple questions here. I think this is kind of a, a little bit of a funny one because, Doug, I think you used the word um, bust out. <laughs> ah, <laughs> I mean, you, for those of us exactly. that are laymen and maybe not familiar with that term, can you yeah. bust out? <laughs> so a bust out is essentially when the owner of the agency that themselves decide, you know what, I am going to, the business is going down, um, I'm going to go out with a bang, meaning I'm going to flood the market, with as many tickets as I can, hopefully taking in cash, checks, wires, um, and so that um, I'm gonna walk away from the business with as much cash as possible and then disappear. We also have uh, historically, and thankfully it's been a long time, but uh, sometimes agency owners will um, unwittingly sell their agency. The, uh, they're always required to alert ARC, go through an ownership change pro process. Not, unfortunately, not all of them do that. They simply they take the money from the from the buyer and they walk away, and then the the proposed or the new owner is the one who's really a fraudster. The the intent was to gain control of that agency to commit that bust out okay. and disappear with as much money as they possibly can and and we monitor for that um, so we look at the the volume sales volumes for spikes so we look for spikes in that and we also look for the shift between uh, credit card and cash uh, transactions so if we see anything out of the ordinary we can we can act um, um, in in line with that we also of yeah. course compare this against our financial is instruments that we hold uh, for agents so we, we do look at this on a daily basis and we monitor for this uh, for these types of spikes and potential bust outs. And, and historically, we also re, um, will rely on hearing from uh, airline sales staff. So oftentimes they'll get word they'll hear word that from an agent saying, "Hey, uh, so and so agency is getting this great discount. Um, I thought I was you know one of your top producers. What's going on?" When in fact the airline has not come into agreement with this uh, with this agency. Uh, it's it's a sure sign that uh, a bust out is occurring. So we do rely on hearing you know from uh, airline sales staff that hey something's going on in ABC agency or XYZ agency. But you we do really uh, rely on hearing that um, that information and. and doing what we can to uh, interrupt the, the bus stop. And I, and I think that feeds into another question we have in, and I don't want to steal your thunder, Judy, <laughs> but uh, the next no, question go ahead, here is, <laughs> what happens if an agent is not in default in the eyes of ARC, but refuses to work in AD Airlines for um, outstanding ADMs? Is this something that ARC should know about, and is there anything that ARC can do to help recover funds? You'll see through the whole presentation here that we are going to talk about collaboration. And so with that in mind, yes, we want to know, can we do something about it? Depends on what it is. So share the information with us, we'll evaluate it, and we'll let you know what we can do. But, you know, um, and as we build out this new environment of risk events and irregularities, you know, depending on what you're dealing with there, we should be able to assist, uh, um, but we need to know about it. Mm -hmm. So and you'll, you'll have my email and Doug's email later down in the presentation, or you can just send an email to us at stop stop fraud at ourcorp.com and we can uh, engage with you from there. And we also want to make a distinction between losses due to commercial reasons, right. meaning 
you have a contract with the agency to take 5% commission on a ticket, they took 10. That's a commercial issue in our in ARC's view. Uh, now, uh, if they're taking 90 and 100% commission on these tickets, now there's an element of fraud. We really want to know as soon as possible about when the activity looks like fraud, talks like fraud, it's fraud. Please let us know. All right. So, yeah, and on that topic, what, what, what does the future state look like? And I think that was also another good segue there for us to look at our risk events and irregularities. So moving into the future state, applying all of, all of what we just reviewed, we group the irregularities and risk events into three pillars to help identify severity versus action. Our first grouping is administrative and system related um, uh, issues. And this is where we look at payment, system integrity, and reporting accuracy. A second environment is financial, uh, where we monitor the behavior of the agents and how they perform in the relation to the requirements of the ARA and IAH. So these are very much compliance-related factors that we that we look at. And then thirdly, we look at things from an operational perspective, where we look at and validate who we do business with and their business models. So we do run a lot of we do look uh, we do run OFAC reviews, we do anti-money laundering reviews, and we do regular you know your customer. Um, reviews as well. I don't know, Doug, do you want to add anything? I think you touched on that. What if not? <laughs> yeah, um, we just want to say it again, you know, <laughs> we're not looking for little violations of, of a contract. It, you know, we want to know about, hear about, and intervene when it, when it looks like fraud. Because if it's happening on airline A, it's a very good possibility it's happening to airline B. And they may or may not be catching it. So, this happens all the time where we either internally find an issue within an agency through our systems and reviews. Uh, we do very much rely on hearing from airlines directly. So um, all the time, you know, I'll get a phone call or an email from an uh, airline rep that is saying, hey, Doug, uh, take a look at these transactions. Something funny is going on. We believe we're uh, losing revenue. Um, and then you go into Memo Manager and find out, well, two other airlines have recently debited the agency for similar activities. So this is a, another area where we want to uh, collaborate more. Uh, so if you see a problem, please alert it out. You know, if you see something, say something. It's very important that you know, not everything, we're, we're, we are, I will guarantee you, we're not catching everything. Yeah. Um, we do really rely on our airline partners to let us know what's going on. And you'll see at the end, yeah, we're going to ask for your help. So, um, you know, stay tuned. We, we're getting to that point. Um, so just to just to conclude on this slide, these items listed here are only a handful of actionable irregularities and risk events our team can act on. Coupled with the agreements, our objective through the application of these risk events is to act with positive actions, hoping to drive a compliance environment without disruptions to the value chain. Take effective actions, driving real changes and value of our program. And all of this needs to be done in a timely manner in which we need your collaboration. Yeah. By collaborating, we'll be in a better position to reduce risk and maintain revenue integrity. So let's look at some of our initial data points, which we've, uh, um, which we, which we've been looking at and using to set our future state um, and, uh, and how that will be, you know, how we hope to um, improve in, in these areas. So as part of the governance documentation review, we wanted to understand the overall impact on the industry and how best to identify and assign these risk, these events. One of the main areas we looked into was chargebacks. With a value of about $46 million in 2018, it seemed a logical place for us to start. By better understanding the reasons behind these memos, the origins and the impact of them, we could identify that through our existing processes, we have had a positive impact. But to do more, we need to be in, better in a better position to take positive and effective action. This is where our event environment strategy comes into play. From our analysis, we've identified that a large percentage of these memos, memos originate from fraud 
against agents caused by serial fraudsters, and another reason why we need to build out a future state environment. ARC is in the best position to identify these activities upfront through collaboration, we could reduce the burden to both stakeholders. Today, today ARC issues alerts notifying stakeholders of the activities that could negatively impact them. We require feedback on these alerts, be that positive or negative, to improve our rule set and, and to help us act uh, on those, on those uh, concerns. So in our next slide, and if my computer will work with me, to the next slide and just stop. Oh, there we go. All right. So, <laughs> sorry about that. So these are just two samples of the alerts that we use. Uh, the one on the left is the one we sent to the agents, and this is mainly related to card not present uh, fraud, credit card fraud. Um, and uh, the one on the right is what we send uh, to the airlines. So there you'll see the ticket numbers, you'll see the PNR. You'll see all the information related to um, transactions that we've identified as being um, affected. And in both of these documentation, we ask for feedback and responses. You know, the better, you, the more input we get. And again, it can be negative, it can be positive. The more input we get, the better we are at what we can we can do, and the better we are in informing you. If you are not receiving these today and would like to receive them, please send us an email at stopfraud at rcorp.com with the subject line alert, mm -hmm. and we will gladly include you. And of course, I don't know if you want to. yeah, I'll just add it. These are both recent documents. Uh, we uh, we started sending them out in this format maybe within the last couple of months, yeah. basically, and we're continuing to hone them as well. But as Cornelia said, the the um, memo on the or the alert on the left is going out to the agency community. Uh, we, As I mentioned before, we want to be very proactive in combating, uh, especially the credit card fraud, payment fraud. Uh, we know that, um, you know, agents are on the hook for this, but if we can intervene with and help our agents spot when they're unwittingly issuing tickets for a fraudster, um, you know, keep a loss at three thousand dollars rather than allow it to climb at thirty and one hundred and thirty, because agents can pay three thousand. How many agencies, especially our brick and mortar mom and pop, how many of them can cough up uh, thirty thousand or one hundred and thirty? Because we know what happens when the when the agency can't pay those dollar amounts. We know who the loss sits with, and that's with uh, our airline stakeholders. So this is why we like to be very proactive in combating credit card fraud, and uh, I think we've been pretty successful. Uh, those, do those dollar amounts that you just saw, the $25, $28 million, um, you know, we're constantly trying to refine what we're doing and uh, go after these guys. Um, unfortunately, some of them, are, or many of them, are not even in the country, but they're out there every single day targeting our agency community, and we want to protect them. And then, of course, uh, the one on the right is a is a brand new uh, uh, email format. And um, you know, whenever we spot suspicious activity, uh, we will be sending out this alert to say, "Hey, airline, we think there might be something going on, but we of course need your validation. Let us know that are we on the right track here? Is you know, can you validate it?" And then is it supported by a uh, an ADM on the back end so that you can recover it? And of course, uh, this this allows us to intervene with the agent who might be doing this earlier. So once again, spotting the the potential fraud early, working with the agency, tell them to, uh, you know provide a cease and desist, and and stop the activity from. Uh, from occurring, so we're, both of these are still a work in progress. We'll get any of that in, that data out of the, their their report, so it doesn't even come in your downstream uh, operations. Right. You know, so you don't have to raise debit memos. There's a cost to raising debit memos. You know, we can avoid it early on. We can we can excuse me prevent it from coming through that mm -hmm. through that um, operational channel. 
Yeah, and I'm just going to, um, again, interject a question here that I think is important. Um, does ARC verify a valid ESAC code for each void exchange or refund event? Um, can they just, or can one just be made up? Um, is there a non-fraud non reason why agents um, would get an ESAC code? Can either of you kind of enlighten us in that area? I wouldn't want to go too deep into this. I mean, it, it, it depends, but um, I'll give it over to Doug in a second. But we've recently created our, uh, not recently, but we've developed our early warning environment where we do look for ESAC code. But I'll let Doug explain mm -hmm. a little bit more. So once again, that's a works in progress, but we are looking for ESAC codes either completely missing or they do not conform to the standards so that um, we can get these highlighted, look at, you know, what's the agent up to? Why are they not using, or why are they not obtaining an ESAC code? Is it a one-time event? Is it a, is it a, is there a pattern? And then we're going to, we'll be reaching out to uh, the impacted airline to say, hey, uh, something might be going on here. Uh, can you confirm? Because we really always need an airline to confirm our suspicion that something's going on before we contact a, an agency. But there are valid, or there are agencies out there that are that are doing uh, manual voids. They're not getting the off code, but there's no downline impact that we can see. So it does happen. They shouldn't be doing it that way, and that's also an opportunity for ARC to reach out to the agent saying, when you're doing this. Don't be. Don't use IAR to do the void. You do, you need to use the GDS to do a proper void. Yeah, this this builds into what we what we're going to show you in a little bit as well. Is that you know through the issuance of uh, events we can keep record of it, right? So how many times has this happened with this agent? You know we could have the the first time might have just been an honest error or a training issue, um, and uh, we keep record of that because we will reach out to that agent. We will have a discussion with them and we'll try and educate them and train them on the correct way. We've got a whole team here in our customer service environment that, that will provide training to, to the agents on how to properly um, file their reports. So we will work with the agent in that level, but if it happens again, you know, we'll take a different action or if it happens a third or fourth time you know, in a certain period of time, you know, our, we, we'll, we'll take different, we'll, we'll, we'll approach it from a different angle, but we do, we do engage. So moving forward, um, let's have a look at uh, why it's important for us to receive your input and collaborate. So this slide, you know, it's not, it's not meant to scare, but these are just, just facts that we've um, put together over the last maybe two years and so on. And here we'll uh, focus on um, some of our daily daily statistics and some of our annual statistics. So uh, ARC processes in the region of 789,000 transactions daily. And this is data as of uh, August 26, with a dollar value to the amount of about 126 million. And this is daily coming through. As part of our risk and irregularity environment, to the question around ESACs and VOIs and so on. We look at for, for those things, and we approximately look through about, or oh, sorry, fish out about 20,000, 21,000 transactions that is initially marketed at, at risk. Now, this is initially at risk. This is not the final number. So uh, it, this, this goes through in another review uh, stream. We, the, 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 um, consultant uh, working in that queue um, reduces that number down, you know, they filter out all the false positives there, and it gets considerably reduced. And from that bucket of, uh, of, of the transactions that remain that we consider as being true risk, and those are the ones that we are sending to the placing carrier uh, via our alert for validation, and we need that validation back in. And then we're looking at, um, you know, Based on these notifications that we've seen, you know, especially especially around 2018, 2019, year to date, that our response rates from the airlines are very limited. We get a very low number there. We've got about a 28% uh, response rate from those airlines to whom we've sent alerts, and that's that's pretty low. And uh, we really want to build that through with your support and and improve that statistic. So again, even if a response is not provided, we have other ways to identify if action has been taken from that alert. Of course, we have the 
transaction number, we have the ticket number, and we are looking for that in the bank back end of the memo to validate, okay, well, okay, we didn't get a response from you, but you know, hopefully it would have pushed you to raise that debit memo. Now we don't see that. We don't see that debit memo either. Now that also leads to us, and we know that there are other means for you and other ways for you to recover that or, or deal with it. And of course, you've got other, Doug mentioned this earlier, you've got different agreements in place. You can deal with the agent directly, you can resolve this directly with the agent. As well. um, and we don't necessarily always have insight into all of that. And that's all good and well, but not receiving any feedback limits us in the actions we can take on behalf of the industry, on behalf of your airline. So again, receiving timely feedback will assist us in taking timely action, mitigating potential losses. And to approve that early warning tool yeah. that we've put into place, knowing that you know it's it's filtering out a little bit too much. Can we mess with our you know uh, our the, the filtering guidelines that we have in place to always continuously improve? That warning tool. Okay. And so, uh, based on our 2018 data, approximately four million dollars are left on the table by the airlines. This is based on about uh, on the 72 percent non-response rate from 46 airlines having been sent an alert. For some, the impact is minimal, but for others, we see numbers in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Receiving positive or negative feedback. Uh, on our alerts are essential. And I know there's a lot of repetition of the same stuff here, but we want to make sure we get our message across because the more we get from you, the better we can we can we can do what we what we do. So we and we know there are other means for you to 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 um, to recover these funds. Um, but you know we are here to drive collaboration because if we can act at the front end, we can prevent any of these things from coming downstream into your operations. Uh, because we can deal with the agent uh, first and you know and 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 help them out as well. So let's look at what we are doing today to prevent fraud funneling into the airline and settlement system uh, of the airline. So okay, so we prevent fraud from coming into the airline value chain via our form of payment function, looking at fraud affecting agents with an indirect or unintended impact on the airlines. So looking at this data. Um, and I'll just quickly go through it. Um, you can see uh, through our form of payment effort, and we mentioned that a little bit earlier, this is around the alert we send out for card not present um, uh, transactions. So here we've, it's broken out in uh, traditional fraud, corporate and loyalty fraud, traditional being red, uh, being the most uh, savings that we've brought in there for the agents. I mean, we're sitting at $742,000 Saved as the 2018-2019 data, but overall, you know, we're sitting at around 800,000 uh, or close to that. And I just want to make sure that, and that we're all on the same page here. This is only looking at two markets today, and we're looking at South America and Southwest Africa. So uh, we are we are extending our, um, our our rule set to 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 start looking at more global data, of course. Uh, from the memo, we use a lot of data from memo manager to identify where fraud is uh, most, most prominent, and we build that into our um, daily reviews um, of the FOP. Now, on the right there, the right uh, pie chart is looking forward, so it's taking that 740 um, amount and looking forward as to what might have happened if ARC did not send that alert out to the agent and or the agent did not act on that alert and, and issuing a void or obtaining a refund from the airline. So we see there that, you know, and this is based on a seven day future future projection. And we see there that that's sort of sitting at nearly, you know, four point something million, four point three million dollars that could have affected the industry. That's a lot of debit memo. Yeah, and that's a lot of money, especially going back to um, you know, when the agents don't realize that they're being targeted by these fraudsters, they're extremely appreciative of ARC sending out that alert, <clears throat> picking up that phone saying, hey, can we, we see these um, strange, suspicious transactions. Can you let us, you know, tell us about the customer? And we'll say, hey, you are being targeted by a fraudster. You need to stop uh, issuing any tickets. 
And also, you know, are there any that are unflown? Can you void them? Void them immediately and also the ARC service fees. So we are able to intervene and get them to, uh, to stop, uh, you know, dealing with that fraudster. So it's, it's once again back to that disrupting what, what the fraudsters do. So, um, so early detection of in our FOP fraud uh, prevents it from entering the airline's back office. And bringing the two functions together and receiving timely feedback from all stakeholders, are could be in a better position. So this is back to us receiving uh, that feedback from you. When we send out that alert to you and you respond back to us, we can immediately go back to the agent and say, hey, this has been validated as being a, a concern. Let's work with you to resolve this. Let's not make, make sure it doesn't go into your report. And, and we can get it out that way and then we can uh, reduce that downstream impact. And again, collaboration is key to maintain a secure and efficient distribution and settlement environment. So what does it mean to the airlines? Well, we've estimated that uh, the average cost in raising a debit memo to the airlines is about $56. Uh, you, everybody might have a different different number there, but this is the average that we base it, base it on, on our reviews and research. And the actions of ARC and the agent realize the savings because these transactions that we're looking at on this slide right now, these are transactions that, that you didn't even know about, that didn't come to you because it was taken out. Yes, maybe you touched it because you had to issue a refund, but the agent voided it within that 24-hour void window. So you, you had the opportunity to to, um, to 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 do something with that seat or resell that seat. So Doug, Doug has some additional insights and the impact uh, fraud has on our industry, and so I'll move on to his slide. Yeah. And we did have a question about what the LPA at 3.9 million. So once again, it is back to if ARC had not reached out to the agent, how long, what would the losses amount to before the fraud ran its course? And we estimate that it's over $4 million. So we, uh, we definitely saved hard dollars over 850,000, but it would, would have been over 4 million um, had the, fraud ran its course through about seven days. Yeah. But here's a few things, uh, a few more stats. Uh, where we're talking about here is, is going after the serial fraudsters, the, the fraudsters out there pretty much every day, co um, contacting agencies. These are phone calls, emails, they're getting into corporate booking tools, they're getting into your online presence, um, your online websites. And um, so we're always looking for patterns, patterns of fraud. These are just a few of the cases that we go after on a daily basis. You can see from Accra Pipeline and Bogota, uh, Casa Morocco, so it's, uh, uh, we believe a fraudster out, uh, operating out of Morocco, a New York cash out crew, West, uh, our general West Africa fraud. So these are uh, fraudsters that we're in there trying to track on a daily basis. You, almost, you also might be uh, wondering about loyalty fraud. So think about loyalty programs through your bank, um, where you're, the more you buy, the more miles or points you accrue. Uh, so those banks have to partner with uh, travel agencies in order to turn the points into tickets. Fraudsters who uh, on one day might commit a traditional credit card fraud, they're caught, the tickets are voided, and the fraudsters, um, um, now they're trying to get um, now they're trying to get a ticket. They might get into a bank uh, account and commit loyalty fraud. So we see them hopping back and forth between the two streams. So when we intervene and work with law enforcement, you can see on the right hand side is a chart showing uh, a very big upward spike. This is a very specific case of a domestic fraudster where we were collaborating and working with uh, the U.S. Secret Service to get them um, to get them to intervene. They did stop and interview a passenger. The passenger was arrested, and you can see on a very specific date the rapid drop-off in the activity. So the fraudsters were alerted that they were being shadowed. Um, we are happy to report the, uh, earlier this year that the ring, uh, ringleaders were arrested and we'll be reporting out within the next month or so uh, after sentencing. So this is uh, shows a good um, example of, of why we intervene the way that we do, why we collaborate with law enforcement. Yeah. 
And so let us just run forward here and sort of bring us back to what the future state will look like. You know, we've talked a lot about what it, what we're doing, how we're doing it, and and the gaps that we've identified and so forth, and that. And so, how are we gonna how are we how are we gonna um, close these gaps? So, we're we're gonna build out our irregularities and risk events. You know, um, we're gonna assign a severity score there to the agents. We're gonna work with them to resolve it. We're gonna run our KYCs. Um, and and we're going to take action. Uh, if 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 nothing gets resolved with the agent, of course, we default to our uh, Section 13 actions, um, as we as we would in any other scenario. But our intent is here to work with the agents to resolve the problem, safeguard the distribution channel, and, and ensure you know you are made whole for any concerns or issues um, uh, uh, arising from that. You know, and what does this do, and why do we want to do it? Of course, it promotes uh, promotes collaboration between ARC, the agent, and the airline. And it ensures best business practices are applied at all levels, and also strengthen the ARC accreditation model and add that value to you, the airline, to know that whoever you are letting into your distribution channel has been properly vetted by ARC and are being monitored by ARC uh, on a daily basis. It ensures consistent. Uh, it, it ensures a consistent ecosystem is maintained for the distribution and settlement, and it. You know, it upholds the expectations you, from you, the stakeholders, and it also assists us in identifying gaps in our uh, current state and future state of operations. And the actions that we will take, and these are all conceptual, but some of this is already in play, so uh, bear with us. But we want to educate and inform the agents of what they've done. Of course, we see a lot of times it's a training issue. It's a it's a legitimate error. You know, we want to have that chat with them. We don't want to throw a section 13 at the agent. Uh, for no reason, uh, if we can resolve that firsthand. Yeah, and sometimes it, when we're talking to the owner, they'll not really realize what's going on. It's they could have a rogue employee, they could have a rogue independent contractor in there doing these things, and the agent isn't or the owner isn't always aware. So sometimes they're very grateful to say, "Oh, hey, thanks for letting us know. You know, we uh, we need to uh, take action." We'll get to that. We'll get to the questions at the end. We're running close on time, and we've got a few more slides to go through. So please hold on to your questions. We don't get to them. We'll email you. Um, uh, so yeah, just moving on again. That objective and that value proposition we're looking for is to build trust. Uh, you, you know, to reduce that, those preventable debit memos we've touched on earlier. Ensure our settlement systems are kept safe. Drive support and revenue integrity for for everybody in that value chain. Ensure diversity in the distribution channels. You don't want everything going into consolidation. Um, you know that gives you a little bit less leverage, etc. So you want to keep that dis those distribution channels um, diverse. Uphold the reliability of the above mentioned governing agreements and reduce conflicts in the value chain and build trusted partnerships. So how are we planning on doing all of this, and what is needed from our stakeholders? Well, the first thing would be to establish with your support and industry group. So this is what I said earlier, guys. We need you all the way to the end, and this is why. <laughs> all right, so uh, in order to establish a group, we need to agree on our objectives. Here we have put forward a handful of suggestions that we think should be at the top of mind. They are to drive excuse me, collaboration between the airline risk managers and revenue management. Identify and inform on fraudulent or suspicious activity as it occurs, affecting and affecting our settlement environment. Help detect, prevent point of sale fraud. Share business intelligence within legally supported frameworks. Establish best practices and work together to drive change. The hope is as we stand up this group that we can reevaluate these objectives and drive mutual agreement. In order to make this all a reality, we need your buy-in. If any of you are interested to work with us on this, please reach out to Doug and I our emails are at, we're going to show that in the last slide, and and, uh, and, and you can take that down and reach us uh, that way, and we really want you to participate with us, and we can build this out. We'll also send another reminder email about that, this initiative um, after after the, uh, the webinar session. So just before we get into our what next slide, I want to do some fear mongering again and reflect on some of the statistics as to why we need your support. Well, again, we, we've identified that uh, $4 million are being left on the table by the airline. We're looking at a potentially 20,000 plus uh, transactions uh, daily that, that could represent a risk 
Of course, that gets narrowed down considerably. That's just an initial look. And then 72% of the alerts that we send out is we, we don't get a response on. So I'm asking you guys, what is your exposure and how do you want to manage that? Okay, so what what is what's next for all of us? So, and we're going to cut it close. But <laughs> so the next steps for us, for ARC, is to cement our already developed strategies, which include the finalization of our irregular, irregularity and risk event rules and tools, scoping out our EBR environment, uh, identify changes to be made in the government's documentations, and validate with our legal team those, obtain as as and where need be support from our joint advisory group we mentioned those guys earlier on and inform our board of the changes and objectives of course our board to consist of you guys the airlines identify and receive from you your interest to participate in the industry group and help us develop further the objectives for the group and the charter for the group and help us to identify the best platform or format to share this information Okay, great, um, Cornelius and Doug. Uh, there's a few questions here at the end that we can uh, get to quickly, and then we'll kind of just wrap everything up. Great presentation, a lot of good information. Um, there's been a few questions in regards to if this deck can be shared. Um, um, if you email me, jhowardarccorp.com, I'll be happy to send you a copy. Uh, the recorded session will uh, be on our website. Uh, where you would find all of the recorded sessions for um, under our airline uh, customer area on the site. But there's a couple questions before we end here today. Um, is behind the scenes um, question behind the scenes? Are you using machine learning to detect fraud? We have uh, we are developing some quasi uh, machine learning um, in house. Uh, we with uh, with an IBM solution that we look at uh, some of our transactions coming through. We also are uh, building out some other environments where we are hoping to rely on machine learning a little bit more. But um, today we very much a rule-based environment, um, and our rules are our rules together with our human intelligence is what drives our risk management team. So um, we very much focus on that. But there is room for um, machine learning, and we are looking to further further what we have already in place in that in the in that realm. Okay, great. Um, there's also a few little housekeeping. Thanks for all the great questions today. Um, I think we got to most of them, but I do want to uh, also reiterate, I know Cornelius talked about it um, at the top of this, at the front of this uh, webinar, but uh, look for the date, September 12th, September 13th, which is going to be all about loyalty fraud, which Doug touched about um, and touched on a little bit in this presentation today. I think that one's not to be missed. So we have September 12th, September 13th, 25th, 26th. Those are all um, for our airline customers. Those are all geared towards you. So please look for information on how to sign up. You can go to arccorp.com under our events section, and all of our webinars for the Arc Fraud Awareness Month will be listed there. Uh, so we hope you can join us. As uh, Cornelia said on the screen here, um, there's his. Uh, contact information and there's also Doug. There's also our uh, fraud hotline, the 855 358 0393, or you can email us at stopfraud at arcorp.com. So please utilize all those tools and then we're going to go to um, Distribution Evolved, which is our Travel Connect conference. Some of you, or hopefully most of you, have already signed up for it. Registration is still open, so please, I hope you join us um, from October 3rd to the 4th. Really a great agenda this year, and I believe Doug and uh, yeah, Doug, will be Doug, Doug and I will have a breakout session as well there, and we'll be talking with Amex GBT about collaboration, surprise, surprise. So uh, <laughs> feel free to pop in there as well and see, see what we have to say. Yeah, great. Um, Doug, you know, anything else you want to add before we end today? No, I, I just want to thank everybody for participating, kicking off our Fraud Awareness Month. This is the first uh, session uh, for the month, and uh, welcome, and thank you, and I hope to see you on the next call. Okay, great, Cornelius. Thank you very much. Awesome presentation, Doug, as well. And thanks, most of all, for all of you joining us um, for this webinar today. Hope that you're gonna, we're going to see you throughout the month. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good rest of the day.